Okay, guys, so I'm kind of giddy, if you can tell, because I'm interviewing an entrepreneur I've been wanting to talk to for a very long time today. I actually walk past uh, their offices every single day. And when I first moved to Austin, I was like, ah, oh, that, that office looks cool. I wonder who works there. And I looked it all up. And long story short, um, I've reached out to the founder of the company, Jason Cohen, and we're going to be interviewing him today. And he's the founder of WP Engine. Uh, just to give a little bit of background on what he's accomplished, WP Engine is a WordPress management hosting company that last their numbers were checked in 2018, was worth over $500 million to a $1 billion. And that was 2018. It's 2020 right now. Middle last year was doing about 132 million in annual revenue. So that I'm probably guessing they've crossed a billion dollar mark right now. So if you're looking for someone to listen to when it comes to building businesses, Jason has a pretty good track record. I'll leave it at that. And I'm so excited about this interview because if you go into the Hiro Slack, which is my company, if you don't know, uh, it's full of these videos from him where he's talking about how to grow a company correctly, ethically, honestly. And, and a lot of the things he's shared have helped me so much as a SaaS entrepreneur. Um, and it's just this video talks, which I'll link to below this video, has helped Hyros immensely growing. So I reached out to him and I reached out to him and I reached out to him and he finally agreed to an interview. So we're just gonna get down to it. And what I want you to pick up from this is just like, how much, how different people that have these type of businesses behave from people that talk and talk and talk. If you go look up Jason Cohen anywhere, he doesn't have some big famous YouTube channel, doesn't have a giant Instagram, he just has a giant building uh, in, in the middle of downtown Austin. And the reason why I like sharing interviews like this is because it's so hard to find these people over the noise and, and all the shouting that's going on in social media and find out like who really should you be listening to. And this is one of the top voices that I listen to when it comes to building my business. So. I wanted to sit down, talk with them for me and for you guys today. And so we're gonna get started. The one last thing before we get started, whenever I do these interviews, I like to offer you guys a really cool special. WP Engine actually is the best place you can host your WordPress sites, which is basically what a lot of our site on Hyros is based off of. And most blogs and most e-commerce stores, they're all based off WordPress. And if you want faster hosting, more secure hosting, I would definitely check it out. And if you go check out WP Engine and hop onto their hosting, send us a receipt at WP Engine at hyros.com and you'll get a reply back with over two thousand dollars in courses on how to build your business how to run email marketing how to run a lot of the advertising that i do and these are full-fledged it's like 48 hours worth of courses that you'll be getting and so just send the receipt to that email and that's just non-affiliated i think it's a great company and if you have a wordpress site you should be hosting it on there so that's it guys i hope you guys enjoy the interview as much as i do and let's just get going Okay, guys, so I'm super excited to have the guest that we have on today. Uh, this is Jason, and I actually discovered, I'm not really discovering, but I walk around Austin every single day, and I was walking down the street in the city, and I saw this big building with WP Engine on the side of it. So I was thinking to myself, you know, I'd really like to get Hyro set level, where I have a big building with a, and, uh, with a big logo on the side. Yeah, this one that Jason's actually <laughs> showing in the background right now. And so I looked up on my phone, I'm like, okay, what level do I need to get to to reach that? And so I looked up on my phone and I saw WP Engine and I'm like, how much do they doing every single year? And they're doing about, last I checked on this article, it might be different now, 132 million in revenue per year and really talks about the billion dollar valuation. So that kind of disheartened me a little bit because I'm only at like 3 million ARR. But um, I started going around YouTube and I, I like to look up the founders of companies whenever I... I you know, see some cool things going on. And I stumbled upon Jason on YouTube and the talks that he's put out and some of the information he's put out in his talks have just helped my company so much. And so I reached out to him and I managed to get him on today. And so Jason is the founder of WP Engine and the CTO. Um, and basically I just want to get him on and ask him some questions for you guys because it's been super influential on my company. So Jason, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Cool. So I'll just kind of kick it off. Um, a few things that really, really interest me is, first off, you've managed to bootstrap a lot of companies successfully. Um, you've had two exits so far with, with uh, Watchdog and then uh, Smart Bear. And so the first thing I wanted to ask is that usually when I, when I talk about SaaS or I think about SaaS companies or software companies, um, Usually a lot of people think you have to lose a ton of money up front. It takes years to get profitable. And that's kind of what I've experienced at one of my companies. But you've been able to start companies fairly quickly and pinpoint what companies are going to get a product market fit and get them revenue pretty quickly. So I kind of wanted to talk about that first because a lot of people are intimidated by starting software companies um, because of that. So I, I think the most general question is, 
I, I think you have, you've had multiple SaaS companies that have broken the million dollar mark and you've exited two of them. You have an extremely successful one now at WP Engine. How do you decide what to make? How do you decide what the market needs and, and think about, you know, what proc should I make that can get a proc market fit? Yeah, I can, I can actually answer that in, in detail because I went through that process, a specific mm -hmm. process in vetting uh, WP Engine. And I had an idea before it, which I also vetted with this and decided that other idea was not a good idea. In other words, mm -hmm. I'm capable of, of deciding my ideas are bad, which is hard. That probably yeah. took me a, at least a decade to realize that sometimes I'm not right. Uh, I'm not totally convinced that's still true. Um, yeah. I, I would say though that there's so many different paths that companies take to success. Sometimes you find people who get really lucky, they get customers right away, revenue right away, it just starts exploding and it's really obviously a good thing. Sometimes it takes a really long time. This is sort of the point of Seth Godin's book, The Dip. And the problem with that is, um, how do you know the difference? Because they kind of look the same <laughs> in yeah. years one and two. The ones that will never get off the ground, the ones that do kind of don't look different. That's a that's a big problem. So so hence, hence the need to be more systematic and figuring out is this a good idea, which is what your question is, which I'm going to answer uh, again in detail. But but I think I think this is a critical point that, that people because people who are on a bad path will often use the excuse, ah, oh, well, companies often take a long time to get going. And yeah. right, and, and so it, I did that with my first SaaS company, yeah. like hardcore, like three years, and like and then finally I'm like this, we need a pivot. And that's a huge, really part. I mean, wasting a, a couple of years of your life on something that's the wrong thing is a huge waste. There's probably no more expensive thing to do like yeah, in your life, exactly. <laughs> right? So yeah. that's a really important point. Um, and worth spending the time and effort to try to, to try to systematically do something better or try to figure it out. Okay, so um, the first thing is that you are, your idea is probably pretty good or you wouldn't be so excited about it. So the goal up front to vet it the problem is people often want to just have confirmatory evidence. So in other words, I'm going to talk to someone for 45 minutes about how good my idea is. And don't you hate it when X, you know, in other words, leading questions were like, yeah, I guess I hate it when X. Um, and, and then what happens is you end up in a sense selling them for 45 minutes, maybe even by accident. And you're probably a decent salesperson and you probably have an okay idea. And so you'll probably be reasonably successful. And none of that is helpful in figuring out if this is actually a good idea. Yeah. So this is, I would call that sort of the crux of the, of the typical customer, quote unquote, customer development conversation. That's the problem. And that's why it doesn't lead to, to, to that. Okay. So how do you have a, how do you do the customer development? How do you, how do you test or have those conversations so that you're not fooling yourself in the sense that you're actually learning something? So here's what I did um, and continue to do, by the way, at WP Engine as we continue to launch products or think about different personas and so forth. So first of all, Coming at it as a scientist, what, is this, what, what, what you do first is you write down your theories and then you go test them. If you don't write down your hypotheses, then you're not, it's not clear what it is that you're testing or it's not clear what you're learning. So the, the way I write that down is it's, it's, it's simple, like literally just a list as a column in a spreadsheet. Like this is not rocket science or, or magic technology. And I just write down the things that I think. I think that I'll just, of course, use uh, current examples because I, it's, it's handy. I think that the, uh, a freelancer who builds websites has between five and 10 clients. I believe that that person has to uh, manage passwords to get into those sites and, uh, and they don't have a good way to do it and they hate it. They, they're annoyed by that. I also believe that they think that that's a security problem. Like they actively think that's a security problem that they probably want to solve because it keeps them up at night. What if, what if uh, someone gets my passwords and so forth? Um, this is obviously a hyper specific example of like password manager, right? But it, it, it's fine because it's, 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 uh, it, it's illustrative. Okay. So then you go to, then the next thing you do is you say, what could I ask that would not lead the witness that would try to, that would probably evaluate this theory. So mm -hmm. I can't say, so uh, how many clients do you have? Like a couple dozen. I can't say things like, do you worry that putting passwords in a Word document is insecure? Because man, if you put yeah. it that way, uh, I, I yeah, mean, so I have to say yes, <laughs> just to yeah. not look like a, a terrible person, right? Like whether yeah. I actually think that or not. Um, so, you, so that's what I mean by leading questions. So I can't ask those. So what would I ask? I, you know, an obvious one would be like, how many active clients do you have? <laughs> There's mm -hmm. obvious. Or open-ended one is like, uh, do you ever think about those passwords? Is it, is it, you know, does it ever cross your mind? And if so, like, 
what are you thinking? So these are open-ended questions. They may not even talk about security. That's kind of the point is you're trying uh, to find out what okay. they think, but you have in mind what you're hoping, right? That's important or you're not learning something. But at the same time, it has to be open-ended so that you discover what really happens. Only an open-ended question will lead to discovery of what's really in the other person's head. Also, they may think security, but they don't use the word security. They may, they may, that may be the topic, but they use the word hackers or they use the word compliance if it's a big company, say. Um, so in other words, even if you were right about something like security, your words might be wrong. And when you go to write that ad word to get their attention, you have to use their words. When you go to your homepage to capture their attention so they don't bounce, you have to use their words. Yeah. So even if your ideas are right, you still need their words so that you incorporate that so that it's more effective and so forth, right? Because because you need to speak their language. I assume you literally. did it a lot when you're, you're thinking about what features that of the software as well. You can kind of tell users what they want, but you kind of have to... Yeah, that's really that's a really interesting way to look at it. Yeah. So you basically find your market and you have a general idea and you ask them questions, but they have to lead you back to your, yeah. your original hypothesis. And here's what will actually happen. Some of your hypotheses are right and you'll confirm it and be, and, be, and be proud. And you'll have some detail you didn't have before, which is extra helpful, like, like terminology, but also numbers. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in our case, I discovered there are freelancers who have a few customers and freelancers that have dozens and very few that have 20. It turns out there's these different business models. So even though I was kind of directionally right on this number, I actually learned something new, that it was this bimodal thing. Now from there, what do you do with that information? Well, of course, that's up to you. You could decide, oh, good. Well, then I'll have two different messages and advertise in two different places. Or, oh, I'm going to focus on this one segment of the market. Maybe someday I'll expand to the other one, but I'll be really clear on what I'm focused on, blah, blah, blah. So, so even when you're quote unquote right, that doesn't mean you can't learn details that are really di di directly useful in whether the, the thing you build or the, or the techniques you use for going to market. Remember, that's half the battle. Yeah. Um, it will be right. Of course, like a third of your things are right. A third of your things will be wrong. Good mm -hmm. thing you ask open-ended questions to figure it out. And then a third of the things are just like crap happens when you ask open-ended questions that you didn't think about. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Is yeah. that a thing? So here's what I do with all that. With the things that are wrong or, or new, at, after the conversation, I go update my theories. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, and, and there's yeah. no, again, there's no science. There's no like, here's how many so times. You get a good like, feedback loop going. Of course, right? So yeah. my conversations evolve based, but, but, I've, but I've set myself up to kind of more objectively than otherwise to see what that evolution looks like. Now, what it looks like when the idea isn't that good is mm -hmm. that the hypotheses do not converge on one truth. So okay. like, wow, there's, there's some people care about security and some don't. And some actually care about, some people have SSO and some people have this tool and some people are, like surprisingly hate technology and some people, and you're like, Jesus, like it's not, I can't find a persona or a pocket or you might say a market in here. So although you have this great idea and you're probably not wrong directionally about the idea or the problem, it may not fit what the market cares about or what they say or what they want to pay for. Like that's another thing is I, I absolutely think you have to talk about price in these conversations. Mm -hmm. There's very good arguments not to. So I'm not, I'm not trying to put down the advice that is out there from very smart people that say, this is the time to figure out pain and, 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 and the customer's uh, life and circumstance, not price. But I, so I think there's rational arguments there, but I disagree. I think price is just as much of what the product is as anything else. Mm -hmm. I think when you say blah, 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 and also it's $1,000 a month, it totally changes the conversation. The fact that it totally yeah. changes the conversation is why you have to bring it up at the beginning. Because if you go through the whole thing and then it turns out, oh, I would just expect to have that for free because reasons. Uh, then, then, then who cares? So like all the rest of it is who cares. So of course it's not exactly who cares. It's, it's just that you can't leave out the price. It's just as much a, a feature or aspect of the product as anything else. It determines who's going to buy. It determines how they're going to buy. What, like how much thought they, they put into it. Um, like, oh, I'll just, you know, try it. Cause what the hell versus like, wow, I'm going to have to really consider what I'm giving up. I'm going to have to stop paying for this other thing. I'm going to have to get permission if it's a larger company versus I'm, I can do it without getting permission. Like price is a really big, thing that has to be figured out. So anyway, so it could be that you have this good idea, but the price just doesn't work out or the need doesn't work out or they agree there's a pain. They just don't really care. It's not in their top three things in their life that they really care about. So like, yeah, I guess I, I guess I, I agree that 
putting passwords in a Word doc is bad, but you know what? The Packers aren't going to steal my damn Word document. And then they may be wrong about that. But if they don't care, then they don't care. <laughs> like that's that. You can't evangelize that, right? So that is <laughs> that's all crit. Like because I've I've thought about it in like different ways, and that answer really like I never thought about. I thought I'd have like an idea, and then I just I would usually try to test sell the idea, and I kind of end it there. But how you say you know you have the hypothesis, then you get the open ended questions that I always lead question people when I'm doing like a sales pitch or something like that, and you let the person kind of tell you what's important to them. And you kind of go back and form, get the feedback loop to develop the idea. That's really interesting. Yeah, so I just and, and look, a core idea. Conversation, there's conversations where you do want to lead the witness because you're making a sale. Yeah. Totally fine, right? It's just that's not what these conversations are if you're trying to evaluate the the, the idea as a business, right? And, and mm-hmm. so it's easy to get trapped in, in my ideas are generally good. This is a pain, and forget about. But the price has to make sense. The go to market has to make sense. The customer has to already think they have this problem because otherwise it's too hard and expensive to convince them that they have the problem. They have to already have the budget and the will, blah, 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 blah. Because it's the only way that an ad word is going to catch your attention or an email is going to catch your attention or the homepage is not going to bounce. There's so many things they have to get through, obviously. Yeah. That's not going to happen if you're involved in evangelism. You could, but that's a whole other business to build. That's if you have lots of time and money, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Maybe it's freemium for a while because reasons, like because then they then they figure out that you know that, that they actually do need it or whatever. Like th- those are all perfectly valid businesses. But but yours, you started by what about bootstrapping? For bootstrapping, having massive freemium stuff that goes on forever and costs many millions of dollars of support. It's not impossible. Again, there's no such thing as impossible in this world. I'm just saying it's mm-hmm. generally incompatible with bootstrapping because you got to make money, and you don't, you can't afford mm-hmm. to just throw away money on free, uh, free crap. Like, in general, yeah. like, you can't afford to acquire things that don't have, generate revenue. In general, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and so that's probably not the right model for you. You probably need a model where people are already ready to go in terms of willingness to pay on things I just listed. Yeah. So, the, so that that's what you're trying to find. The... So it's okay. It's possible. Okay. In fact, likely, likely that you have a decent idea. You have identified a reasonable market, but it's not a business or at least yeah. not a bootstrap business or not a cost effective business. That is actually the most likely scenario. How many projects there are on GitHub? They're not bad ideas, but they're yeah. not the whole rest of the business can't be built around it or isn't anyway. And the answer is the vast majority of ideas yeah. are like that. And so you have to yeah. expect that. So it's, it's hard to find something where all those other pieces are there. So, so I, again, I had this idea where, again, it didn't converge in that sense. It was like, ah, like I have these, like there's these nuggets of good ideas, but it's not converging on this thing that's going to work in all these ways. And therefore it's not going to take off. And then with, with WP Engine, it did work. It, it was converging. And, and by the way, the what convergence feels like is the conversations are boring. Because yeah. you're, it's like you ask this open-ended question, oh. but you know they're going to answer A or B because you ask. Yeah, because, so this becomes right? predictable. And you're like, like what yeah. the hell? This is like boring. Good. Boring means you're not learning anymore, which doesn't mm-hmm. mean there's nothing left to learn. It means this process is not useful for learning anymore. <laughs> right? This particular yeah. way isn't. And actually, building the damn thing is probably what you're going to have to do now, right? And so, mm-hmm. and, and and of course, be agile and iterate, blah blah blah. But like. You probably need to start doing that and, and, and because just talking is, isn't working anymore in terms of learning. So, so boredom is good, you know, in a sense, like that's what convergence looks like. Uh, and, and so how many of these conversations do you need? It depends. Some people tell you crazy things like a hundred, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that more is possibly better if, if you believe you're still learning. Although I, I would argue again, like if you're still learning brand new things in the hundredth conversation, maybe it's not converging. <laughs> like maybe yeah. this isn't, maybe it's not obvious enough. And <laughs> maybe you need a better an idea that's more obvious. But, uh, yeah. um, but I, but, but I did 50, five, zero for WP Engine. So, but here's the benefit. 40, um, 40 were, were, rel- were, were sort of interested anyway, even though it wasn't a sales call. And 30 were customers at launch. Yeah, I saw that in one of your talks where yeah. you did you talked to a lot of people about it, but then they're like they came on board too at the same time. Yeah, because it, because like, it, because it converged on something right, and there was actually a thing. Well, now that's not so bad. So if if, if you're going to get some customers, and of course launch is silly, like not the launch, but uh, it, if you're going to get some customers out of it, actually, well, then having uh, you know a couple you know a couple tens more than you would otherwise, that's maybe not such a bad idea. So I think you have to feel it out. I'm not sure there's a rule, but three or five is the wrong number, <laughs> right? Yeah. And a hundred, maybe it is, but I'd, I'd question, like, are you just, pro, are you just stalling <laughs> like one way yeah. or another? 
note that point. Okay, so two other questions that come up a whole whole lot when I see people saying, you know, should I start a SaaS company? Should I get in a software company? Um, the first one being, obviously, you start off, you're an engineer and you've engineered other companies, so you didn't have to particularly find an engineer um, when you're getting off. A lot of people who want to start SaaS companies, they don't really have an engineering background. They maybe have, I have a marketing background and kind of a product background. So I had the hardest time finding a good CTO for a long time. What suggestions would you get? Because I feel, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're bootstrapping a company, the most essential roles you're going to need are probably the CTO, of course. And then usually you'll have the marketer who might be starting the company. And so you can kind of build something with just those two. How do you find that, that yin to the marketer yang? And if you watch those, we used to say, Everyone here is either building it or getting rid of it, meaning yeah. you're making or you're selling. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And those exactly. physical stuff. So we really did get rid of it. Like we put it in envelopes and sent it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So I agree. Like, especially at first, you just need to build or get rid of it and that everyone else is not useful at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that there's a, there isn't like a definitive answer on how to find that person. It's sort of like asking, okay, listen, I want to get married. Um, mm -hmm. how do I find the perfect soulmate? It's like, well, yeah. that, there's not going to be a magic formula for you. <laughs> right. I will say a few things though. Anyway, um, one is like the fight club thing or not fight club, the matrix thing of you do not know someone until you fight them. So you probably yeah. don't really know someone until you work with them. So having worked with someone, even at a distance at another company is a good way because you know something about them. Is there a way to trial working together as opposed to jumping right in? So one problem people do is uh, there's often like the person who really is the, the founding concept, they just can't yeah. really do anything unless they have a co-founder. So they go find the co-founder. Now, after that, it's equal, right? It's co-founders. Yeah. And that's good because you want that sort of um, personal buy-in and so forth. That's good. Um, no, no problem. But... If it doesn't work out, one of them, to, one of them is the one who is really screwed here, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So if that person's the marketer, especially like if this doesn't work out in three months, how is it that you can break up and the company is not totally dead? Because if, because mm -hmm. that question is usually not answered in the same way that most marriages don't have a prenup. And then, yeah, it's probably just game over at that point. So just like a prenup, it's hard to have that conversation, especially because you're trying to go into it saying, let's be optimistic and nobody wants to screw each other. Um, and yet you're saying, yeah, but, but what if it doesn't work out and who gets to decide that? You know, does, mm -hmm. if something's built, does the marketer still just get to decide it's not working out anyway? And then what? So that's difficult, but having some way to undo it without tanking the company is, is a way to de-risk it. Um, Working with the person is a good way. And then the final problem is, as a marketer, you can't interview that person. I mean, you yeah. obviously do, but all you know is, is like personal, interpersonal stuff, right? You can't evaluate like, do they get things done? Can they solve crazy problems? Do they, are they going to work really hard? Um, you know, like these are, you can't, you can't evaluate their, you know, coding skills or engineering skills or decision-making skills in terms of architecture. Like these are things you can't really evaluate. So do you have friends who can help do that? You know, because yeah. because usually what happens is people just hook up. They're like, he seems really smart, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, that's great. That's, that's, that's like right. That's how I pick. That's how I pick a doctor too, because I don't know how to ask about anything either. So, so you know, background checks are very important. I don't mean background like that they that they go to jail. I mean, I mean like your reference check. Really, those are super important. Um, are there other people you trust who themselves are CTOs or people of this position who would be willing to do an interview or otherwise like try to help you evaluate really spending some effort on that instead of just, you know, hoping that's probably useful because it is a blind spot. So you've got to like intentionally go make up for that blind spot and some other things. If you want to de-risk the situation. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I didn't go through all those phases and I, I, I don't wish I had it with my current CTO, but the Pereira ones I had, I'm like, we got together first few businesses. The first lesson I learned was like, you got to have that prenup. I'd start these <laughs> SaaS companies and the guys, I won't get into it, just doing some wonky things. So, yeah. all right. So you got the idea, you got a, you got an engineer, you have the ability to start a company at this point. How, when you're bootstrapping, I haven't seen you talk too much about paid traffic when you're starting off, maybe a few AdWords ads. How are you getting these? You said maybe you want to get your first 150 customers and have that kind of equate to 10,000 a month in one of your talks. 
how would you go about getting your customers at first when you're, when you don't have the ad budget, you don't have money to dump on stuff and you don't have a huge amount of investment money? So first of all, I'll just say, I'm not the, I'm not the leading authority on that kind of, like, you want to call it growth hacking. You want to call it just, you know, just, you know, make, making it happen. I have done that, but the, here's the issue. Each time there's something that, that I did, which today you couldn't repeat. With yeah. Smart Bear, AdWords were brand new. It was 2001. So mm-hmm. like it was, it was no, no joke. People would say things like, I didn't know what that box even was. So I clicked it. <laughs> you know, you were just like, and also the ads were fit five cents a click. Everyone, <laughs> you know, cheap as hell, <laughs> right? People were like just fascinated by it. And it, it, like, so it was just totally different. So who cares what I, so I, yes, I, I grew yeah. smart bear business and who cares? Cause like none of that's relevant today. Yeah. In fact, it was not relevant when I started WP Engine, which by the way is 10 years old. So even then my, my own experience with AdWords is totally irrelevant then. And now of course different again. Um, so I feel like, I feel like even where I've had success, that doesn't mean that, that what I did then, or that, that kind of thing is like applicable. And, and I'm not like one of these like uh, growth hacker people. So yeah. I will say this though, back to, uh, I'll recall that pricing is critical. If your price is $10 a month, you're going to have a problem because whatever you spend and do, whether it's social media and you're spending your time or in your, in your writing or you're online or whatever, or you're, you are doing paid acquisition and you're spending some money, whatever it is, it's just the equation to make it cost effective to get a $10 a month customer, especially if your cancellation rate, it starts high, which again, when you're small, that's often the case. Um, it's just not going to work. Like the, the equation isn't going to work. It's going to be too expensive. Um, so that is an argument for price not being ten dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. For a bootstrap company, because it's so hard to get through that those stages and get to things at scale. And even at scale, that often doesn't work. Like there's there's famous companies at scale like Constant Contact, for example, with literally millions of customers where it still just wasn't working. Like it's too expensive <laughs> to get it's like like at some point it's just it's not cost effective, man, you know. And so um, so as a bootstrap company. If the price is more like fifty dollars a month, or better yet, you know, seventy and ninety-nine, then all kinds of techniques are positive answers to your question. Spending yeah. the time to write stuff on blogs actually can convert. Doing straight-up paid ads on, on on super saturated mediums like AdWords actually work. Like so, so I would say you box yourself into a place where you better have magic hacking skills if your price is ten dollars a month, or the possibilities are wide open to you if the price is $70 a month. I'm not exaggerating that much. If you do the math on, uh, for example, um, the, the typical conversion rate of a website, like a, just a hit to a website to, uh, to, to an online purchase is a 1%. And it really is about that for, in, for many bootstrap companies. I've, I've actually done a survey in the past about this. And like, it's a pretty reasonable number. It's not 0.1. It's not 10. It's about one. Right. So, for ten dollars a month, and let's say you need a six-month payback period. Okay, so you can spend sixty dollars um, on this, but only you know you know to get that customer, but only one yeah. percent convert. So that's sixty cents for the click, and right right off the bat, very few AdWords are that cheap if they're any good. Yeah. Well, crap! Like like I can't even like buy an AdWord, and that that's if the traffic's pretty good. Like one percent conversion rate is decent. So the AdWord you know, the AdWord traffic has to be X and, you know, you, you keep multiplying back out the other side of the funnel. And it's like, this is too hard. This is too many clicks, too many views, too many clicks, too much money. I'm making this too hard on myself. So on the other hand, you might say, but that's all people will pay. And again, I go back to, well, then it's probably yeah, not a good bootstrap business idea. Like, like that's why price is such a critical factor here. So I, I don't mean to just rehash what I just said. I, I really, I'm trying to connect it to the question of, of growth because it, it, it dramatically changes the aperture of what's possible. That's probably the single best thing, strongest thing you can do for yourself to get the company off the ground is to have a wide aperture of possible ways to acquire customers. Yeah. That's, that's probably the way to de-risk it the best. That's so funny because I always thought like about tactics and like some tactic to grow my company. And so I watched your one talk where you talked about, you know, getting the higher pricing and stuff like that and getting people to pay the year up front, even by having like yeah. kind of wonky um, monthly prices. And so at my company, we we're having trouble growing when it was like the lower prices and stuff like that. And I thought, well, you know, how can we make the base price $350 a month and get everybody to pay a year up front? 
And so by doing that and unlocked every tactic, because we can just yes. grow just by sending messages. Like, I That's think this it. is a good thing for you. Yeah, it, so it, it unlocks works. everything. And so, so yeah. that optionality or, or that, um, that wide aperture, those, those, all the possibilities, all, uh, things don't have to be as cost effective to still contribute to growth. Mm -hmm. Just those, just saying that feels like that's probably the strongest thing for me to de-risk my mm -hmm. business, to add growth, to give myself the most chances at success. That's just what it sounds like. So I'm a huge advocate. Uh, obviously, you can tell I mean, it, it's common advice. Charge more. Right. That's common advice. I'm trying to really tie it into the practicalities of what it means to grow, whether it's the first hundred customers or the next thousand customers, um, but especially the first hundred. If you want to de-risk and that like like it, it it really it really is that and so if it's like but I don't know if they'll pay that it's like well then do something that's more valuable that they will pay for because by the way it's more gratifying anyway to make something more valuable and uh, or simply in a market where people have more money to spend or want to spend money already are spending more money whereas the VCs yeah. like to say have more money than cents. Yep, that makes that makes so much sense. That's kind of what I've done with my latest company. So I just. I never, I never thought about tying the price to growth though. So that's really interesting. So the other question I have, um, also my phase of my company right now, we're at the phase where we're still doing a lot of things manually when customers come on. And so in past SaaS companies, or I see other SaaS entrepreneurs, and they, they don't realize how much you need to work with the customer when they first come on. So their thought is like, get a thousand customers on and then use little metrics to like analyze them in the back and never talk to a customer. <laughs> um, when you were starting your companies, um, I think I've seen you talk about this a little bit where you, you have to do a lot of things manually and just work with every single customer. How do you, how would you onboard your first customers and, and understand how they're going to behave? And then how would you make sure they get a result? Because that, for exa just mm -hmm. example, just to give some context, my company person comes on and we have an onboarding rep, walk them the entire way through until they see a really good result. And we're trying to kind of transition to the point out of that. But how did you do it at that point to make sure the customer gets it and then want doesn't churn? So a couple things, um, and this is this is a great thing, especially because in the VC world, in the TechCrunch world, the idea of spending time with customers is anathema. Like, no, no support, no, uh, you know, no, no human touch, because that comes out of your growth margin and you can't scale, yada yada. Um, I do believe there's a trap that you could fall into where you become a consulting company, um, yeah. and as soon as you're charging for time, you, you're you're either you are a consulting company, which is great. Just just know that and build your business, the rest of your business model around that. No problem. But if your mm -hmm. business model is product and yet you're doing that, then there's probably a problem because you're you're mismatching your business model and your actions. But I'm a huge fan of spending time with customers to make them successful. And I don't believe in this like mantra, like all that time is waste. So if you do think that, let me at least convince, try to convince you that Early on, you should do that, even if later on you never talk to a customer. Yeah. Early on, you don't know anything. So every time you take, the t every moment you spend with a customer to onboard and understand, like you said, like, like you just said, for them to see success, what the hell does success mean to them? I bet you it means different things to different customers. I bet they see that differently. They measure that differently. They understand that differently. For some customers just ticking a box, that they bought a thing for a thing might be success and they don't care about the rest. Okay. Interesting. For some customers, they need to see certain metric, even if it's on their side and not even part of your tool that, but that's interesting because what if that's a feature in two years where you're optimizing that? And by the way, you can charge 10 times as much if you're mm -hmm. optimizing that thing they actually care about than the thing that you started with. Like that's possible. Mm -hmm. Like all these are possible. And my point is you won't find out unless you're in the customer's head all the time a way to do that early when you have more time than customers <laughs> yeah. is to is yeah. to do this with them so think of it as being selfish for yourself number one getting a successful customer is going to give you money that's worth more time in the beginning when you have more time than customers the second thing is this learning about what is valuable and blah 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 blah, blah. super just like the cover just like the other conversations we were just saying it's, it's so valuable so just selfishly to figure things out for yourself before mm -hmm. you're scaling why wouldn't you avail yourself of this opportunity to, uh, to get a customer that, that stays and gives you money and do those learnings? Now, later, if you say, I've learned everything, I don't need to talk to customers, okay, fine. I would sort of argue that, sure, you should evolve, like the amount of time you spend and who's spending that time should evolve. If at, you know, right now we have about 900 people at WP Engine. If I'm onboarding customers, it's probably a problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> but 
learning about onboarding is probably something we should never stop learning about because technology's changed, markets change, customers change, or you tap a new market, there's new learnings, all kinds of things are changing. It's pretty, it's either arrogant or naive or both to think that like, I got it wired now, so that's that, <laughs> now I know. Yeah. <laughs> like that's pretty, that's, that can't be right. <laughs> and, um, in marketing, we know that. We, did we ever stop A-B testing? We found the best headline and that's going to be our headline for the next five years? Like that's ridiculous. Yeah. Like, come on. So there's probably needs to be that somehow. And of course, sure, it can scale and it can be delegated and, can, and certain things should be automated because certain things are just busy work, just toil, mm-hmm. not helping you learn. Roger that. So that we might want to turn into a video or automate with a tool or uh, like, yes, of course. But up front, you know, get all that value and all that learning because that is valuable up front. And you have the time for it. And when you scale, then you can use the, the then you can use the excuse that I, you can't physically do that. You would need different techniques. But, you know, most companies don't get to that point. So how about let, how about we maximize our chance of getting to the point of having the problem with scale instead of right out of the gate? just saying, oh, I have to build for scale. And by the way, I don't really know what my customers are doing. And that's probably makes me dumb if I don't know that. Yeah. So obviously with WP Engine, I mean, setting up WordPress hosting, um, it can be rather complicated. I would imagine, especially when you guys got first started getting a person to come on, not only buy the software, but then follow all the steps to get the hosting up and then get the result. What we have to do a little bit right now is we have a pretty technical software as well. And so we have to kind of prod the user and like, oh, have you done this thing? Have you done this thing right here? Mm-hmm. How, what things did you see that allowed you to kind of automate the onboarding process and, and minimize your need to contact the customer? Not from not wanting to talk to them, but just you can't really scale it if you're doing everything yeah. manually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we go to the scale problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we don't want to lose, like with our company right now, we work really close with the, com- the, the yeah. customer. But we don't want to lose that that love the customer feels, but we also need to get to the point where the customer can sign up without talking to anybody and get from point A to point B. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. I, um, so I mean, I, I'm trying. I'm trying not to say the really obvious things like automate and blah blah blah. You know, yeah. have checklists and send emails. Like these. These are all the obvious things. Obvious things work. I mean, the <laughs> obvious things aren't always oh, obvious. You okay. Know? Well, the obvious things are. You know, uh, number one, measure what it is that the customers are doing. Like, why are they keep talking to you? Where do they get stuck? What are you having to remind them about? You know, and okay. categorize them. So like, so, so, at, so when you're in the scaling part, so we, before you're in the scaling part, it's all anecdotes anyway. This customer did this, this customer did that. And that's still sufficient for you to realize there's probably a really glaring problem that you can go fix. So that's fine. At scale, the anecdotes are not as important. You're like, no, I've got, I've got too many things to actually address all these things. So I need data. I need to be more data driven. To be data driven, I have to have data. That means I have to categorize these things. So I can't just say like, there's there's support tickets or there's chats. That's not gonna help me know what to do. I'm gonna need to categorize those chats. Then I can say, oh wow, this is what people talk to us about. Or I get data from my, uh, my let's say web portal or something like that, whatever you have, right? And you're like, oh, here's where people get stuck. And by the way, lots of tools out there for measuring this for you. You don't have to write this code. This is, this. there's there's plenty of tools that let you, that, that um, let you see what customers are doing. Some, sometimes literally taking a video of what customers are doing so you can yeah. see, like, to, you know, uh, but also data like, oh, here's this form. And, and most people, like most people get stuck on this part of the form or spend a lot of time there. And by the way, here's some videos of people actually getting stuck. All these tools exist, like full story, and there's many of them. And so go, go invest in a couple, in one or two, maybe even just one, see what you can learn from it. Maybe a second one, if you realize there's still a gap, right? Like, and, and it, that's what I mean by going and getting the data. Yeah. Then you can start figuring out, okay, well now here's where, where I should invest in automation or you know, sometimes it's automation, like something should happen. Sometimes it's a, a problem that actually it takes some weird technical thing to prevent the problem in the first place, as opposed to automation on the front end, or maybe it, automation means sending emails because you really, really do need the customer to do it. There's nothing you can do about it, but you can automate the, the conversation, like sending an email. If, you know, if, if this thing is not done in a day, send an email. And if, you know, like, again, there's tools that do this. So, you know, you use them. Um, that, that's what automation can look like. Um, not all support contacts are necessarily bad. I feel like sometimes it's better if the customer has a slight problem, but then has a fantastic experience with your company in solving it because then they come away going like oh good like even if it's not totally conscious it's like these people have my back if i run into another problem i think they've got me and and it can be a good experience and not if they have to contact you nine times to set it up that's probably not a good thing but like a little bit of it actually could be 
long-term retention. And if it is, it's not necessarily a problem to go optimize away. Maybe, maybe not. Now, of course, that's now getting into the art a little bit. The, the data will not tell you the answer to what I just said. I just want to put it in your brain so that as you're analyzing, you, you know, that's art, but you can still think like, ultimately, is this a better experience for the customer? Um, a couple of things to think about. I'll give you some, I'll give you like a little framework also to think about the customer's experience. This will also maybe help evaluate this data, evaluate what, what can be done. Um, what does it mean for something to be a great user experience and effortless? Obviously, lots of frameworks out there. Here's a really simple one. One is the customer needs visibility. What is happening? What stage am I at? What things are not done? What things are broken? What parts of my plan am I about to hit a limit? Or can I reduce a plan because I'm so under a limit? Uh, visibility, what is happening? Cust people feel good when they understand what's happening. Yeah. It's, it's happy and they don't have to ask you. <laughs> so that's support tickets, right? And it, it indicates, it, it, like, it like sort of indirectly indicates you've automated the data that the customer needs and perhaps that you yourself need for that matter. So that's also a good sign. So visibility, that's, that's one step of a great uh, effortless customer experience. Uh, it, that goes to these questions of automation. Okay, second one is control. I want to do it. Can I do it? I want to do this step of the process. Am, am I even capable of doing it? Are you giving me the ability to do it? Sometimes control means like there's a button or a, a page or something in which I can do it. And if there's not, because it's some exception or some whatever, and I have to call it contact support, there's the failure mode. You're not letting yeah. me do it myself. Um, it could be that uh, like, I don't have the information to do it myself. In other words, you need them to do something, but your knowledge base articles aren't sufficient or your information isn't sufficient, so they can't do it. You know, like there, there could be other modes other than a button in your screen that would mean they don't have control. But control means I decide what plan I'm on. I decide whether this feature is on. I decide whether to make some sort of trade off, like this makes my thingy faster, uh, or sorry, this makes my thingy slower, but also more secure. And I decide, you know, you know this kind of thing. Um, I give the permission for this other user to do this thing or, or not. Like, so, so uh, control is another thing. People, when people are in control, like one of the experiences you hate online is when like you click a button and it just like it reverts. And you're like, ah, oh, I don't trust this. I can't do it. I have to call support, but I don't, I don't believe, you know, like it's, it's so aggravating. So, so control is another, is huge, besides visibility, control is another. And the final one is intuitiveness. It could be that the data is there. It could be that they have control. But if they don't know it, <laughs> it's too hard yeah. to find. It doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I don't need to belabor that point. But that goes to both what you would call UX, um, mm -hmm. which in, in IA, information architecture, which is like, how does it work? How is the information organized? How does the things work? But also even visual and, 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 and UI, colors, words, icons, you know, uh, 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 things like this, that, that whole package goes to like, do I understand? Do I, is it intuitive? Do I wear it? And again, when, when people feel like I get this, um, it's good. Uh, you know, you can tell when people have like, when people switch phones and they're like, I don't want to do anything. I mean, surely the Android phone can do everything that the iPhone can. Surely in terms of visibility and control, it's about the same, like at a high level. But the intuitiveness, oh my yeah. God, right? Like that's what's yeah, killing it. And it's just so devastating, right? So. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's, there's like UI rules here, like no, don't have, no surprises. Surprises are probably bad unless they're super gleefully beneficial. If, it's, mm -hmm. if, if the surprise is because this is how you've always wanted it, then that's great. Otherwise, don't surprise, you know, because yeah. that's just going to give you So, that, you know, that's just another way of saying what I'm saying, of course. So I think that, that's an interesting way to, to think about. So if we're talking about a scale, then you need frameworks and data to sort of like sift through and figure out what to invest in. So I think that's an interesting framework that puts the customer in the center and asks like what makes it the best for them and not calling support number, yeah, right? But because life is good for that, right? Yeah. Not, not, right? Like not because there's some weird barrier to call support, but because life is actually good. So I think that's a, that's a framework to use to, to evaluate those things. But again, you need some tools and data to ask what is really going on because it's too invisible otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you said the obvious stuff. All that stuff is like, oh, look, oh, we need to be doing that like, right now. <laughs> so transitioning more just for the sake of time, kind of skipping the, the mental part to like the growth part. So <clears throat> at, at your company, uh, you said you were good at managing about 40 to 50 employees and then you, you don't think you're the best CEO or maybe you just want to go to the CTO world because um, that's where you love to be. 
So at my company, what I'm also finding a lot of is I'm kind of more marketing and product. I, I, I saw you talk about it. I'm like thinking they all, the CEO job is turning into a whole bunch of different things. And so my question to you is when you got to about 40 to 50 employees, how does the CEO job transition to something? How does it change? And basically, yeah, yeah let's look at that. So I think there's these break points in companies' growth. Of course, they're not precise. Of course, they, there's ranges and so forth. But I do think that within the ranges, that's pretty accurate. And so what, what probably a lot of people right now can relate to who is listening is there's this break point around something like 12 or 15 people where like you, it's not possible for everyone to know everything all the time. And we need a manager, like yeah. our first manager, the first time mm -hmm. someone's not reporting to the CEO. And that's a big moment right there. Like nobody wants to not report to the CEO and founder anymore. <laughs> so that's already not good. <laughs> and, uh, and to be to not be in the middle of all the information exchange feels different, and so already it's sort of like the beginning of something else. Um, and from that point on to, like you were saying, maybe again it, it could depend on the company. I can explain why, but 30, 50, 80. I know that's a big range, but like something in this like mid hundred, like 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 fifty plus or minus twenty, let's say. At that moment, what's happened is. The, um, other than perhaps like a special co-founder or some special uh, person, the, the CEO only has managers reporting to them, maybe even one level deep. If it's something like, yeah. uh, well, in this case, we have a deeper org in, uh, you know, tech support. So there's a couple layers. There's two layers there or in, you know, engineering. So there's two layers, there, or whatever, right? Like there could, something might have one more than one layer. Yeah. And hiring managers to do a thing is extremely different than managing ICs, extremely. Yeah. Like every instinct you have as a founder and CEO to go decide or go do or micromanage or author instead of edit, every one of those instincts, which you needed to start the company. Like if you didn't have that, you never got this company off the ground. Those instincts were all incorrect. Okay. At 30, wrong. Because your job at 50 people is to build teams. Mm-hmm. And if you can't, if, if you're not hiring a manager who is better at building that team than you are, you have failed as a CEO because it means you are not up-leveling the abilities of the company. If it's only as good as you, then you're not up-leveling your talent. And not up-leveling your talent is a cardinal sin of the CEO. One is running out of money, <laughs> right? Yeah. And one is not up, constantly up-leveling talent. There's no other way to, to grow and it not be a disaster is, is constantly up-leveling talent. Some of that may be people within the company are growing. Awesome. That's an up-leveling of talent. Mm -hmm. Also, when you're bringing in people, of course, that has to be up-leveling as they come in. Your problems are harder. You also have more money to, to, to pay them, <laughs> right? Yeah. The problems are also different. Like, of course, you have to up-level or you haven't done your job. That includes your own area of expertise. If you have not hired a, let's say, director of marketing or whatever, who is better at building an, a, a uh, let's say an acquisition funnel than you are, even though you're expert at it, you've still failed. Because otherwise what you're saying is my marketing department, um, I still have to run it effectively. Mm -hmm. And as a C at, 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 at 10 people, you're damn right you do. You're the best person to do it, you're damn right. At 50, you, if that's still the case, that's a failure mode because mm -hmm. you don't have leverage. You haven't up-leveled the talent. You don't have enough space yourself because at 50, the CEO shouldn't be working on freaking acquisition campaigns. You have different yeah. things to think about, like talent on every department. And at any given time, various, various things are on fire. A product's on fire, science is on fire, HR, uh-oh, we just had an incident, we never have HR, like that's actually a problem. Like there's constantly things all around the business. To have to think about an AdWords campaign just because you're a marketing expert is certainly a failure mode if those are the problems that you're now faced with. Um, at, 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 at that scale, you also have things like you probably, you probably did not have full-time HR before 50, but by the, but, but now it's a problem because there's an incident or people are under, worried about medical or someone had a baby and everyone goes, Oh yeah, do you get to leave? Uh, but you're, does it, does it matter like what your role is in having that <laughs> baby? What if you're adopting? What if it's like, Oh my God, we're missing HR. Um, so, so like these things, there's enough people that there's enough things that happen. That, that you start yeah. going, oh man. And finance, like it's not enough to just do 
uh, you know, QuickBooks anymore. You got it. Like there's yeah. things to do. Oh, and, and like, do you need ENO insurance at this point? Well, again, at 10, hell no, that's not what's going to kill your company freaking getting sued about something like that's yeah. not, you're going to kill yourself at 50 or hundred. There's all kinds of things that can happen. And actually at around at something like that point, again, you're probably negligent if you don't have certain kinds of protections like that. Whereas at 10, it's crazy to be spending your money on it, right? Like this is what yeah. I mean by things changing. I'm trying to, you know, list some of those very things, right? So that's where your head has to be as a CEO is maturing mm-hmm. what that org means in those kinds of ways. Of course, that you can keep talking about, but these are the kinds of ways the org needs to be maturing at that point. So for you to still be, you know, editing a blog post or you're like, that's crazy. Like it, you better have, have hired someone who's even better than you at that stuff. So that that yes. work continues to grow and get better, despite the fact that you can't be, you know, you know, micromanaging it. Now, of course, you always have your specialty, and that's fine. That's of course not what I mean. I mean you have to be spending your attention on these new things, these different things. So your attention can't be on that. Maybe twenty percent of your attention can be, but it can't be like this thing that you have to drive, or else it's not that good. That's that means you're not building a great team, and that's a cardinal sin of, of CEO. Yep. So there's more breakpoints because there's the old like. After 150 ish, you know, you don't know everyone's name anymore and so forth. So there's like a, there's some break point. Also at that scale, uh, whether you're virtual, in which case you definitely don't know everyone, you haven't even seen their faces probably, yeah. um, or it's physical, you'd like, you can't, you can't be on one floor. You, so there's still like a lot of people you don't even see. So even if you're in the same building, much less different buildings, like it's still like a different feeling. And of course, there's all these studies that show people that are on different floors are uh, communicate just as little as people in different, uh, uh, different cities. Like, like, so, so even the floor, like that, it doesn't really matter exactly how the physical thing is. The fact is like you run into this physical problem and just cause you're online doesn't magically fix that. You still also don't know 200 people in Slack. That's not the case. Yeah. Right. Like you don't know. And so, and so uh, again, communication changes. It's so difficult to just, just communicate a simple fact to 200 people is like almost impossible. So you have to do it in different ways and different times and then record it. And like, it's just basic communication is hard. So if that's true, how do you communicate strategy? How do you align on strategy? What about culture? How, how do you have culture growing if just communicating like one date to somebody, to everyone is hard? Then how the hell do you communicate culture to everyone, which is this ongoing, that's another thing we can talk about for a whole hour is culture, especially at scale, but anyway. And so what the hell, like that's completely different. And so forth, right? So, so, so I, I think there's these different, roughly speaking, uh, breakpoints. And that's why, like they, they, they're, they naturally occur. Of course, there's been various attempts in the past to say, no, we'll break that trend by having these things like holistic, holistic or holacracy or whatever the heck it is. And of course, they've all failed. Like every single one has failed. And so even though probably a lot of people on this call, and me too, feel like the traditional mm-hmm. command and control feels old it feels military it feels disempowering it feels like this can't be the right way um and you see various problems with it which are very true and then you're like well surely this can't be surely we've evolved and yet all these other ways seem to fail even when you have super smart people that are completely into it and they cannot make it work it's it's like well that doesn't mean command and control is is good and it doesn't mean that like we shouldn't keep trying different things and certainly there's different ways there, there's literally the military command and control that's that's not an empowering uh, uh yeah, although no. the military is much more empowering now than it used to be and now it is true that the troops on the ground who are in the thing in, in, a, in a skirmish should decide what to do and like that's that's understood now right so even there like actually some of these learnings have, have happened so sh- of course there's different structures but the bottom line is uh so far, we have we as a human race have not <laughs> have not come up with substantially better <laughs> things than this. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you won't come up with a better one. But when you're at eight and you're looking at someone with even 50, much less 500, and like they're dumb, they're doing all this stuff. We'll never do that. Don't be so quick. Do yeah. do keep the skepticism. That's healthy. That's healthy. Don't give up. Right. But mm-hmm. but uh, no, it's not true that everyone else is dumb. <laughs> That's not true. (laughs) So maybe it's more like, okay, these things are coming. What shall we do to take the edge off or do a little bit better or handle it better rather than like the whole rest of the world is dumb except us, which come on, that's not true. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And I think what you said about if you're not focusing your time building teams, you'd fail as a CEO. And so 
Like for example, at my company, I'm, I'm the best marketer there, but I also find myself if the, the job is pulling me way more from, you know, it was first 10 of us all working together, or just anyone can do any role to the point where I'm like, I'm flexing way too much in other roles and I'm being dragged in more of a manager of manager direction instead of like product and marketing. So yeah. I found your transition really interesting and really smart to keep the company fun to work at because that's what I enjoy working on. I don't really enjoy like hiring or managing or like creating communication systems. I like working on the product and marketing. So yeah, me too. And so, so then you have to have the humility and introspection to say, wait a minute, I just said, I don't like hiring and communication systems and HR and some of these other departments in, in detail. So if I hold on to being the CEO, despite having just said <laughs> that I don't like doing the things that a CEO at 50 needs to do, not just do, do really well. Like the, like the success yeah. of the company depends on it being done well, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. right? Like if I'm not willing to do that, then aren't I putting, aren't I hurting the company by being in the position anyway? And that's the conclusion I came to. Very true. Right. And so, but that's hard because like, but I don't want to give it to somebody else because it's my company and that's very true. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it's hard. And then what does everybody else at the company think? Because, they're used to you being the CEO. They, they're thinking the same thing, right? And what if, just like we were saying with founders, what if it doesn't work out? Is there a breakup clause? Uh, LinkedIn is a really good example of, uh, they, you know, the, the founder, Reid Hoffman, super famous and blah, 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 super smart, all the things. Then they bring in a professional CEO for all the reasons we just said, <laughs> and it didn't work out. But they had the, they were able to recognize that. They said it didn't work out, sent the CEO away. They brought in a second one and this time it was, uh, you know, their current CEO and incredible, wonderful success, marriage made in heaven with the founder and CEO and, and the success of the whole business, just absolutely phenomenal. So like great lesson of like, okay, you're absolutely right. It might not go well. So how do you set this up so that if it doesn't, you can undo this without breaking the company and get to a place where like me with Heather at WP Engine or like Reed with Jeff at, uh, at LinkedIn. Of course, I, fortunately, I didn't have a, a misstep first, but that you, you could say that was luck. It's not, again, you think, you think the LinkedIn board and, and Reed Hoffman were dumb? Yeah. No, of course not. Like it's possible to have a misstep. Give me a break. Right. Like, uh, so, so fortunately we didn't. Um, but, having that ability to, to undo without breaking the company is super important for that kind of a move. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, like I said, all just blows my mind. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave it to one more question just so we can respect the hour. So obviously you got the, when you got the company, the 50, 80 employees, I think the, your first, I don't know how many smart bear had, but like this is the first time the company's really reached this. Right. Um, escalation for lack of better words so this is all just brand new territory and, and the amount of people that actually reach this point or even get to like five million ar or something like that's very very tiny so it's kind of just a no man's land right and even at the point i'm at, i'm at right now there's not really too many people there's it's, it's just you're in this no man's land and you have to pick the right path to go down yes and there's no signs or anything so how do you guys navigate that how do you decide what to focus on and, and what to do when there isn't really a clear path you know it's well brand new. So are you asking what we, what we do today? Like, what does it look like at, at some scale at, at 900 people? Or are you asking? That would be super interesting going if from we could 10 look to at 50, like maybe 50 people and then 900 people. Like that's both super interesting. But, okay. So. Okay. Um, I find that most small companies don't have a strategy. And if you don't have a strategy, then it's really hard to know what to do. And it's really hard to say what to do because there's, there's no basis. Why is there no strategy? Because when you first start off, and by the way, me too. I didn't have it either. I'm not like, uh, I'm not putting anyone down. That's me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because when you first start out, you don't know anything. Like, what are you basing a strategy on? What data do you have? What knowledge of the market do you have? What customer information are you basing it on? What assets do you currently have? Like, these are the things you use to build a strategy. And the answer is, I don't know anything about the market. I don't have any customers. I don't really even really have a product. Um, I have no, I have no advantages <laughs> you know, or yeah. assets. Let's say I have no assets to, to leverage. So what the hell am I building a strategy about? Instead, you're learning like crazy. You're following your nose would be a good way to put it. You're just like, Oh, okay, this is good. I'm yeah. going to do this. And like, and you're doing, and you should like, again, I did too. Like there's nothing wrong. Okay. At our current size, you know, we're hiring, say, uh, multiple dozens of people a month. We project things out a couple of years. We, we talk about hiring, you know, we don't, 
when we, when we talk at a high level, we talk about hiring numbers of teams as opposed to people, you know, yeah. entire initiatives that are company wide and so forth. So at that point, so we fast forward all the way to there. At that point, if we're just like, we're just following our nose. Whenever we see a bread come, we eat it. It's like, there's no way that's a good idea. There's no way you can align 900 people around that. <laughs> so that means at some point between, you know, one person at the company and a thousand, like the strategy has to be, it, it, you do have to invest in a strategy. You have to have it so that it can be the guiding way to make decisions. Like where do we need to invest next? Is that in engineering? Is that in product? Is that in go to market? Is that in the net? When do we build the next product versus the product we have now? Do we expand who we're attacking? What, what is it? What are, what is the competitive intelligence and what is our strategy vis-a-vis -vis our competitors? Uh, you know, these are all the kinds of questions you answer in a strategy. At, at the beginning, you can't answer those. You don't have the raw materials. At some point, it's again, you, you might say it's negligent to not have it. And of course you're adrift and don't know what to do and people aren't aligned and it's, you're not clear on what's important, which means you can't uh, prioritize and so on. So at some point you have to build it. Now, where's that point? I actually am not sure. I would bet it varies by company. I bet there's companies where at, by 10 people, it's actually, actually you do have enough information to do it and it's kind of time. So you have a North Star. And there might be other companies just in the nature of it or the product or how, how fast you're growing. Like we were growing so fast at say 10 to even a hundred, but say 10 to 50 people that like, it, it, we didn't need a formal strategy. Like it was so hard to keep up with the demand, which of course is the best possible problem. It was like, oh my God, just, just try to get ahead of this in terms of product, in terms of hiring, in terms of support, in terms of technology. So like, it's okay. Like just go, just go. So like we, we maybe didn't need a formal one until we had a couple hundred people and, and that was okay. okay. It would have been better if we had one before. Yes, it would have been better, but we could kind of get away with it. Um, but you could say at, at, at 10, you need it. And, and you, you could easily argue at 10, we should have had one and th various things would have gone better had we had one. Like you, you could easily make the argument too. So that's why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not quite sure and it might be kind of company dependent when you need to do it. But no, that, that makes that's, a ton of sense. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, that, so that's the thing yeah, our is, is having a strategy. Yeah. Then, then you can make these decisions. The problem with saying a strategy is, is people don't understand what a strategy is. Like people say things like our strategy is to grow 2x this year. That is an outcome, yeah. not a strategy, right? So what mm -hmm. I think a strategy is, is, is this. It is, first of all, a really sober co uh, collection and then analysis and digestion of facts. These are the facts of our customers. These are the facts of the market. These are the, what is happening with our competitors. This is what's going on with, is our market commoditizing? Is it expanding? Is it consolidating? Um, you can use things like the Porter Five Forces thing and go through every one of those bullets. Those are, it's a beautiful framework, even though it's 50 years old. In fact, that's part of why it's so good. Answer those freaking questions about stuff and be super honest. Uh, Reagan has a great quote, see and don't be afraid to see what you see. Mm -hmm. Really, as objectively as you can, here's the good, bad, and the ugly. And some of it is good because some of it's opportunity. Oh my God, this, market, this part of the market is expanding like crazy. It's nothing but opportunity. Some of it is scary. We are not doing this or our customers are leaving us because of that. So the data from customers leaving, the data from support tickets like we were talking about, and that, that other stuff, the uh, surveys you could do, the NPS data that you might do against your customers and what they say when they fill in the blank. Uh, uh, surveys you could do with people who are not customers. That would be interesting to see. Okay, so there's lots of places to go get data. Some is objective, some is subjective, but anyway, you go collect both the objective and subjective and you try to analyze it down. The last time we did this, and I ran this, this process, by the way, myself, which is uh, it, with this framework that I'm, I'm, I'm now kind of relating, um, it was a hundred page document of references and graphs and all uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the kinds of things I'm talking about. Now, of course, again, this is at scale, so of course it doesn't be hundred pages, but yeah. you get the idea. To say what the hell is going on, we need a shared, the whole company needs a shared understanding of the truth so that all of us can reason about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 and uh, it's very easy to deceive ourselves. Well, we're the best at this. Are you sure? Or the market's doing that. Are you sure? Yeah. Right. It's really easy. So it's really important to do that. And there's no judgment. Oh, marketing's so bad because blah, blah, blah. Hell no. Absolutely no judgment. This is, we have to get a shared understanding of the truth or we can't make the, the best choices. So that's the, like it's this collection and analysis phase. Then from that, you have to analyze what are like, if you're small, I would say one at our size, we still only have four key challenges, the key things 
that mm-hmm. facing us that we have to address. And if we address this, pretty much everything else you do doesn't matter. If we kick ass at this one thing, and, and it's a problem and opportunity typically. In other words, the problem is we have these headwinds from these competitors or whatever doing X, Y, and Z. But the opportunity is the, you know, what happens if we solve that as we grow like crazy, because this is our biggest growth opportunity or whatever. Or another example might be a challenge is we try to be everything to everyone. And, and so the, but the opportunity, and so, the, so we have to focus and the, and the risk, of course, is we're wrong or we shrink, but the opportunity is if we're, if we're killer there, we could 10 X the company, even hundred X the company, because, because this is the best one to go to. How did we know that? Cause that analysis I just said, that's why we know this is actually the best. Okay. So the challenges can come in lots of different or and opportunities come in lots of different forms. And just the basic SWOT is not what I'm talking about. Although it is true that you want to take, take stock of these are our assets we should leverage and lean into. These are our weaknesses that we should avoid because trying to do that, like we're just not going to be that good. Here's what our competitors are doing. That doesn't mean we should or shouldn't do it. It should just be part of our analysis of what's the right thing. To, okay. So that all goes into this. What is the fundamental challenge really articulated and referencing the data that prevents you from these wishy-washy things. The challenge is we're not growing fast enough. That's not the challenge. <laughs> like that's not it. That's saying nothing. No, specifically the market, the people, the competitors, the, the motions, the trends, the data. That's that's what I'm talking about, right? Um, for us, we still only have four, you know, right? Like so, so just a few. So one, two, three, four, maybe something like that of these things that are the critical things. Then, finally, the part of strategy is what are the coordinated actions that the whole company is going to take finance, marketing, product and engineering, et cetera. What are we all going to support? What are the coordinated things we're all going to do to meet this challenge and get this opportunity? All of us. Mm-hmm. And those now, and, and by the way, how fun to invite the whole company and this whole process into, because yeah. no one, no, no one person thinks of all the good ideas and all the good answers to this. All the more reason to have that alignment on what's true and then have the alignment on what the key challenge is so that everyone's empowered and able, able to, uh, it, it, to have those ideas because they're so, they're so clued in on what the challenge is to go solve. Now everyone can, is really empowered to go solve it together. And of course, as a leader, your job is to arrive at, at everyone's ideas, obviously, but you have to arrive at you know, the actual work and the priorities and stuff like that and make sure that's aligned. But now, if you have that, now that's a lot of stuff I just said I know, but I was also very specific about how to build it, right? There's no, no yeah. wishy-washiness here. If you have that, hopefully it's clear like, wow, that's what it means to have a strategy, to know why you're doing it. And then now the question is like, so who do we hire? What are we doing? Oh my God, yeah. now you, I mean, you, it's still not trivial to figure out what to do. I'm not saying that at all, but at least mm-hmm. you have this framework now to say, now we know what's important and what isn't. Now we know whether uh, some proposal, can I hire these two engineers to do X? Now you have a thing to hold that up to and ask, is this the best way to attack this thing? Yeah. And now you're having that conversation and you're having it with your other people at the company too, that you're arriving at it together aligned. That's great. So can you afford to take all the time to do it now? I don't know. Again, I, I sort of throw it out there. I, I don't really know when, when is the best time. And of course, you're going to refresh this. Strategies aren't, uh, aren't fixed. You're going to refresh all this stuff over time anyway. So maybe you do a simple version in a month. And then maybe a year from now, you do a more complex version. Or three years from now, you do a big one. I don't know. Yeah. Right? Like That's probably all, all reasonable ideas. But uh, I know I just went on and on about it. But I, I feel really strongly that people don't know what a strategy is. They certainly don't have one. And these questions, this like the ones you just asked, what do we do now? Like yeah. you get a strategy and then you have a litmus test for what, what are the reasonable things to do next? And I think, so I know it went on and on, but hopefully that was, hopefully the detail was helpful in, in really painting a picture of like how to go do this. Well, no, it wasn't on and on. It gave a very clear process. And so, yeah, but at my company right now, we're growing really, really quickly at the point where like, we're trying to keep up with demand. But at the same time, you know, that's a clear way to actually, you're in no man's land, but you can kind of paint where the mountains are and where the hills are and where the lakes are metaphorically. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's um, incredibly helpful. I want to respect the hour because I know your time is very valuable. So I'll let you go. But I, I just wanted to thank you so much for coming on. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone check out WP Engine. It's a very cool company. And there's something I have special for you guys after the video ends. But um, yeah, so that's it. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it.
it was fun. Oh, awesome. Oh, and that's all there is to it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Could you please go in the comment section and just leave a big thank you for Jason at the time's very valuable, of course. And like I said before, if you do go sign up for WP Engine for your WordPress hosting, which is pretty much what I built all my websites on, much faster, much more secure. And if you go check it out and put your hosting on it and you send us a receipt to WP engine at highrose.com, we'll fire back with an email to deliver you almost $2,000. Of course, it's about 48 hours in training on how I do my email marketing, my ads, my copywriting, my sales techniques. And it's basically everything you need to know marketing wise to start a business. So that being said, guys, be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If you like interviews like this, you get notified when we put them out. On top of that, when you're liked and subscribed and hit the notification bell, I do make posts on YouTube that give away lots of other courses as well for free, but I only leave them up for about two hours. So if you want to see those, you need to be like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Till next time, guys, I'm, uh, I don't have anything else to say. I'm just happy with how the interview went and I'll see you well, you know, the next time I see you.